The street corner soapbox. <laughs> the street corner soapbox with Foul So We're Willing. Podcast takeover. We're making a killing. Music to nightlife. Debauchery and street news. Serving it hot. We are some street news. Movies and mayhem. The craziest guests. Words from chaos. Get it off our chest. Rhode Island worldwide. Dark corners in all places. Speak how we live, radio show, smoking aces. Ladies and gents, for the people we're talking, take the show on the road, right where you're walking. Yeah! Uh, that's right, ladies and gentlemen. Street Corner Soapbox Podcast, coming to you live. That's right, boys and girls. Street Corner Soapbox. Now, we all know during this uh, crazy time with the pandemic, businesses are struggling. So we're here to support local businesses, and we need your help to do so also. That's right. So subscribe to our Patreon, become a member to help support the show, and receive exclusive episodes and bonus content, as well as discounts on merch. That's patreon.com slash streetcorner underscore soapbox2020. Follow us on our website, streetcornersoapbox.com. That's right, boys and girls, Street Corner Soapbox. I'm back with my brother, Lord Willen. Yo, what's going on? What up? What up? We got big Steve Tripp in the house. Yo, Steve Tripp, what's going on, bro? What's up, guys? Thanks a lot for having me. Of course. Yeah, guys, Steve opened up uh, Top Strength Project. Uh, Dope Gym, Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Uh, what's that? 402 Walcott Street, Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Yeah, we're, we're right by the stadium. We're actually neighbors with, um, what's the Holly Davidson place over there? Precision Holly Davidson? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. I know what you're talking neighbors. about. Yeah, yeah. Shout out to the bucket. Um, I'm gonna have to come check the gym out. Yeah, but you guys got a huge facility over there. Yeah, we uh, we it's actually our second spot. We expanded there. Was it the same location? No, no. Holy, it's been almost two years. December will be two years in that location. We were over on the west side of Providence, right next to the police station on Washington Street. Okay. For just about exactly three years, about two and a half years in, we realized we don't. We needed more room, so we started looking for space. It took about six to eight months to come to fruition, and now we're over in a 10,000-square-foot facility right on Walcott Street in Pawtucket. Nice. So why don't you get into your background about how you got uh, started in the whole the whole business and just lifting in general, working out, training? <laughs> well, I mean, do you, want, do, you want the, do you want the full story? Or? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, we got time. Well, it's just, you know, but what's funny is, is it was never the plan, you know, um... You know, when you guys do come to the gym and you walk in, when you walk into the Top Strength Project, you know, I, I would walk into a place like that and kind of look around and say, you know, this is a place where, you know, a guy or a group of guys g- got together and, and had a plan. And five mm-hmm. years ago, they were like, you know, this is what we want and this is how we're going to get there. We've all heard the, the fail to plan, uh, where is it, the plan to fail, fail, whatever, the, what, what's that saying? Uh, fail to plan, plan to fail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I couldn't be more honest in saying that there was no plan. This was never the plan. It was just an organic process that became something uh, very special that my partner Vanessa and I are very proud of. Um, many, many year, years ago, as a teenager, you know, I was playing um, college football. I had no intention of ever being a personal trainer, being in the fitness industry, in the fitness industry at all. And um, the, the summer before my senior year of high school, I got into a, a really serious car accident. I fell asleep at the wheel coming home from work. I hit a kid coming the other way, and um, I shattered my jaw, broke oh. both arms, broke both legs. Damn. Yeah, I, I was in pretty much safe. He was fine, luckily, but I was I was a fucking mess. And I spent about a month and a half in the hospital. Um, you know, I kind of had intention of playing college ball. That was my idea. I was speaking to a couple couple good schools, uh, UNH, Assumption, and that was kind of nice. nice. That was kind of my gauge. I was like, you know, nothing's in paper, but I was like, I'm, I'm going to play college ball, and then that's and that's that's my jam. And um, that obviously flew out the window when I was in a body yeah. cast. Oh shit. Um, I started my senior year of high school. I was 6'5", 152 pounds. I shit you down. I was, I'm 275 now. Yeah, so yeah. You about definitely 120 ate pounds lighter. <laughs> you definitely and, put um, some muscle on. You know, so I, I didn't really know what, what I wanted to do. I was kind of bitter. I was kind of like, forget school. I don't want to go to school. And I, I'd always done trade work. I had a couple friends that were carpenters and contractors, so I got back to work for them um, as soon as I got my cast off. And about two weeks in, I was doing a roof in... Uh, Swansea, and I got tripped up, and I, I fell off the roof. I jumped off the roof. It was just a single story, but I landed on both feet, and I shattered both my heels, both my calcanei. Oh, wow. Jeez. So, you know, I was kind of like, well, shit, I guess I'll go to college, give myself some options. I'm in a lot of pain. i got to figure something out. So I ended up going to Bridgewater State, and I started studying exercise science, and, um, you know, started training again. I got back in shape, got back up over 200 pounds, was, was feeling pretty good. I had a lot of residual pain and chronic pain from the injuries, obviously, but I ended up walking on playing football there all, all four years, and um, 
I graduated with exercise science. And and even still, I had no intention of being a trainer. I just wanted to get a degree. And throughout school, I started building condos for a big framing outfit, and I loved it. And that was my intent. I was going to get back to work and just build condos and do construction. Yeah. I always I always loved that kind of work. Hands and, on. Yeah, I always did. I, I and I was working with a great crew. Um, the owners of the company, John and Rich Severini. John, he's probably listening. Um, just great guys. We became very close. They came to all my games. We were just real tight. But if you guys remember back in 2010 when I graduated, um, the market was very, very poor. You know, there, yeah. there was no work. So when I was graduating and, and had intentions of working for them, they were, they were all laid off. So I said, shit, I guess I'll be a personal trainer. So I started, um, I actually started at Fitness Together up in Southboro, Mass. And I trained there for a couple months before getting a job in Providence at Boston Sports Club. Okay. And, um, you know, the business model as a trainer is, is an intimidating one. You know, there's um, there's a ton of turnover. Not a lot of guys and girls um, can, can make it. And when Seems I, like that. When yeah. I, yeah, when I first started at Boston Sports Club, I remember being in the gym. And, you know, I, I would always work out. I, I was always in the gym. I loved being there. And I would always train. And I would talk to people. And just the idea of, of approaching somebody. You know, let's say someone's doing a workout and I notice something wrong with their squat and I walk over to them and I say, hey, you know, let me help you out with that. And, and you know, you, you give them a couple cues, give them a couple tips and they're like, hey, that feels great. And it's like, great. Well, hey, if you want to work out with me, it's a hundred bucks an hour. Yeah. I would tell me to go fuck myself. So, <laughs> yeah. so you know, and, and I remember I had these conversations with my friends. I was just like, dude, what, how am I going to pull this off? Like, I'm not going to be able to do this. Like, yeah. who's going to want to train with me for a hundred? That's what the sessions were. Yeah. Well, they were a hundred bucks an hour. Wow. And, um. You know, just I was very fortunate within um, within within two months of, of working at that gym. You know, I was a part of a great crew, very supportive. Um, I became the master trainer. I became very successful very quickly, um, and I was just um, I was very very lucky. I was doing um, you know 140 to 160 sessions a month, pretty quick, and um, I worked there for four years. And I ended up leaving and going to Synergy, so and Synergy, up, which is where Rob and I met. Um, I didn't leave Boston Sports Club for any reason. It was a great job. I did well, but Synergy was, you know, a, a crazy facility. It wasn't yeah, corporate. It was, I mean, a $2 million office. So it was kind of like an Equinox David Barton style spot. Yeah, it was like, it was, it was, I've never been to another gym really like that. Yeah. yeah I mean, it was Describe like. Describe it a little was, bit. I've heard about it. Was, it. People like, used to tell me just, about it, but. I mean, it was just really. Top of the line. Was, yeah. All blacked out equipment. Sick lighting. Yeah, um, just really kind of dark, but you know the, the right lighting, so everyone looks jacked in the mirrors. They they would really? play house music. Yeah, it would be really? yeah, literally, yeah. and then the AC would be fucking, it would be cold as shit. And they had the cold towels. They had that eucalyptus infused towel. It was a great steam room. Yeah, it's the type well, of place. It was like a club. Cut. It was not. It was freaking cool. Sounds like a nightclub. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was, <laughs> yeah. Not, it was nice. Well, there, there are gyms like it, like Equinox. If yeah, you know, I know Equinox. Equinox. Yeah, um, yeah, and then yeah. the, really the place that he really modeled it after. He actually got in some trouble because that whole slogan, um, "Look better naked." Yeah. He stole that from, from Equinox. Oh, no, yeah. not Equinox, sorry, David Barton Gym. And there's a handful of David Barton Gym, and they do very well in, like, Miami or, like, L.A. In Providence, Rhode Island, not so much. Okay. You know, there really wasn't much of a market for it. But um, I ended up taking my business there just because I saw an opportunity. It was, it was a single-owner gym, and I was kind of at the top of the corporate structure as a trainer at BSC. So I said, look, you know, let's just take a chance and try it. And... Um, I had a had a great two years there. That's actually I was I was offered the position of uh, director of personal training to bring on trainers and mentor them and build the training program, which was you know it was pretty awesome. Yeah, you know, nothing I'd ever seen myself doing. And uh, Vanessa Syria was the first was was the first uh, the first of two trainers I hired. I interviewed like a dozen or so, and you know there wasn't anything wrong with any of them, but you know I just nothing really stuck out. But when I met V and this this kid Tony Bonvecchio was still a good friend of mine. Um, we just really hit it off, and we just started. And they both did very well, very quick. Especially Vanessa, she built a she built a great business and a great following. And uh, fast forward, say a year and a half, two years, the gym synergy itself uh, wasn't doing so hot. Um, people were getting double charged. Our checks started bouncing. Um, the gym itself uh, just wasn't wasn't being run well. Um, but. The reality of it is, is it, it's tough. It, it's tough to have such a high end facility like that in Providence. Like I said, Boston, yeah. LA, yeah. Miami, maybe more of a, maybe more of, of a market for it. But anyway, V and I were out one night with uh, with a couple friends, and we had a couple drinks. She started getting a little mouthy. She gets like that when she drinks. Gets a little mouthy, <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, and and she just basically looked at me. She's like, "Hey, when are you going to stop being such a fucking pussy and open your own gym?" 
And I was just like, I'm not opening a gym. I don't want to open a gym. <laughs> I didn't want to do this. <laughs> I, I, wouldn't even know, I wouldn't even know where to start. And, I, and, and we work at an amazing gym. I could never open a place as sick as that, and it's, it's, it's tanking. And she was just like, listen, you could open a gym tomorrow if you wanted to, and if you did, I'd follow you. So I was just kind of like, all right, fuck <laughs> it, let's do it. So we started, um, you know, getting a business plan together, and um, we ended up, doing a CrossFit competition together over at CrossFit Providence, and we kind of got to talking, and we found a space right up the street. It used to be a construction office, and then we got equipment together, pulled the trigger, and made the move. Yeah. And um, it's, you know, it's, it's not all butterflies and rainbows. It's been a lot of work, <laughs> but we, we've been very fortunate. We've been, we, we got successful really quick. We were busy really quick, hired another couple of trainers, had a great following. Um, there definitely is a market for kind of what we are about, which is, you know, old school style, no thrills, no bullshit, barbell weightlifting. And, uh, nice. And it's just been, it's, it's been great. It's been very well received. Like I said, we were there for three years. I remember you opened that. You guys were barely busy even when you first opened. Well, and, and that, and you know, everyone's like open another location and, and people want to open gyms. But, you know, when you're when you, opening a gym, we, we were we were very fortunate because I had a full-time personal training business and so did she. Yeah. We had the income. We just needed a little bit of startup cash and a facility. And as soon as the doors were open, we were profitable. I mean, we had the overhead expense to cover, but we were making money day one when the doors opened because yeah. we had a following. It'd be very intimidating to say, you know, we have an idea of maybe one day opening another location somewhere else. But can you imagine going to, like, say, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, taking out a loan for 150 k to, to, for the build-out, and then, you know, where's your income? you got to start marketing. you got to get people in the yeah. door. We already had all that. So that, that played a large role in us being easy able to be transition. successful quick. Um, and, and also, there are a lot of other trainers who work in other gyms and are very unhappy where they're at. So as trainers, we built that gym as trainers. You know, the yeah. typical business model of a gym is, is membership. You know, 80% of the revenue is, is the, um, the residual income. The, the EFT income from memberships and, you know, the, the specialty services is kind of like icing on the cake. Our business model is kind of the opposite, you know. 80, 90% of what our money comes in is, is it's the training, it's the specialty services. And we had a small membership at the old gym, but now when we expanded to this new spot, it's a full-blown 10,000 square foot facility. Now we have a membership as well, mm -hmm. which helps cover a lot of our overhead costs. And it's nice because now we have more space, and to be honest, I get to have all the equipment I want. You know, yeah. So, so it worked out very, very well. We're very, we're very grateful and very fortunate. But I, I have to say, it's um, it's been, it's been great being able to connect with someone like Vanessa who really shares a vision. Mm. Um, you know, I don't know if you guys have one like this in your life, but you know, just someone that you can really count on, someone that you really know is operating in your best interests. Um, you know, whether you're there or not, and yeah. you know, business and things like that, it, it can ruin relationships. But Vanessa and I really have a special thing. We really, we really want the same thing. We both want to be successful. We we have the same idea of what makes that happen. Mm -hmm. And um, it, you know, I'm I'm just so grateful to have met her because I, I wouldn't have been able to do it without her, no doubt. Yeah, you know, she's been a huge help. Well, it sounds like a, a good success story. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And and I'm always taken back when I go in, and you know. It's so nice. The people that go there are so appreciative and they're so compliant and they don't feel entitled at all. You know, they're grateful for it because they know what it is. And constantly they'll pull us aside and, and thank us and say this, that, and the other. And it's, it's funny to be on the receiving end of that conversation because I feel like I should be next to them. You know, I'm, I'm just mm -hmm. as grateful to be able, it's corny, but like, you know, th that's where I work out. You know, that's my right, spot. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. My <laughs> thing. It's what I want to do. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah. And I think that's what separates us from other gyms is a lot of the times corporate gyms and, and other gyms are, are opened by people who have expendable dollars. And they're like, you know, I'll yeah. sink 250K into a gym, sell 5,000 memberships and collect. Yeah. yeah. You never, never see I've noticed that happen a lot. Well, I'm fucking there. I got a hammock in the back, dude. I'm always chilling. <laughs> if I'm not training, I'm eating. If I'm not eating, I'm training clients. And if I'm not doing that, V and I are... Are making the facility better. You yeah. know, it's 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 something we both really enjoy, and I think that that is something that's that's noticed and well received by everyone that goes there. Yeah. Would you say you're living the dream? I don't know. <laughs> it kind of sounds like it, man. You know, you love what you're doing. You like being there. A lot of people yeah. can't say that. You got a good team. It's it's a it's an interesting it's an interesting thing. The thing is is we're almost at a point where the gym is completely profitable. I'm already almost at zero. Nice. So when it's at that point, and I don't have to you know, train 40, 50 sessions a week, 
and I can focus more on just building the business and getting uh, it, it, a dream of mine is to, it's to have five, six, or seven full time trainers mm -hmm. there. You know, making eighty to one hundred thousand dollars a year under my roof. You know, feeding them, mentoring them, and, yeah. and having them be successful. Um, a, a true self sustaining business would, would really be interesting. I think at that point, I'm, I don't think I'm the type of guy that will ever put my feet up and collect. But at that point, where I'm not a necessity to keep the place going, yeah, and I can feed it. Um, and, and I'll have more options. Maybe I can travel and, and do seminars with the gyms and stuff like that. You know, I think that would kind of be oh, the you dream. Can, you'll have more time on your hands. Yeah, yeah. But um, but I, I I'm I'm very grateful. I'm, I I really am. And, and um, it's just funny because, dude, it was not the plan. It was, not, it was the <laughs> well, opposite. It turned out well, I think. Yeah. Regardless. Yeah, I, I I agree with you. Have you seen the gym? I haven't. No, no. I'm about to check it out though. Sounds like a dope spot. Yeah, it's cool. It's I mean, it's um, you know, it's it's. So I'm a, I'm a pro powerlifter and pro strongman. Yeah, so yeah. Saw that. I think what the um, what what the what the biggest draw is is there are other competitors in the area, and no one really has that type of equipment. Um, it's stuff that I was ignorant to until I opened my own place. You know, just like specialty barbells. Um, I remember Tony, the the, the trainer I, I spoke to you guys about that I hired with V. He was a competitive powerlifter at the time, and we were at Synergy, top of the line gym. He'd go over to these bars. He'd be like, "I can't deadlift with this bar. I can't squat with this bar." And I remember being like, "You fucking princess! What are you talking about, man? Five hundred pounds, five hundred pounds. Pick it up." But now that I have my own place, I am the biggest bar snob, equipment snob. I, I got a bar and a plate for every single exercise, and the strongman stuff. You know, the logs, the stones, um, the kegs, the you know, the truck pulls, all that stuff. You know, you're not going to find that at LA Fitness. So you have all that stuff at your facility. I have fucking everything. Oh, that's dope, man. And if I don't have it, I'll buy it. Um, nice, man. And so, so that that creates a specific draw for the serious clientele, the competitive athlete, or somebody that just wants to be able to take advantage of having the best stuff. Nice. So, um, and again, it's it's I'm I'm very fortunate to have been able to to build this place out exactly how I wanted because of how well the first place went. Yeah. No, uh, no sirens go off if you drop weights there. No, <laughs> no. I, I almost, I, I almost thought of changing the name, make, making it, making it a uh, purple and, and fluorescent yellow, and calling it, and calling it the Judgment Zone. <laughs> if, if you can rip a notebook in half, then you, uh, not a notebook, a phone, phone book, book in half, then yeah. uh, you, you can't, you can't come in. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that, that, that's, that, that's the intake process. Spit on the floor. Spit on the fucking floor. <laughs> let me, let me hear you grunt. But there's a plan to finish right up the street. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure all the trainers. If that's what they call themselves, yeah. that train there. Yeah, they all they all train in my spot. <laughs> yeah, on the low, right? They don't tell anybody, but no, no, they know. Yeah. Every, 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 everybody knows, and some of the planet people come over, and and they love it, and other people just don't. It's it's not for everybody, and that's fine. We almost pride ourselves in that. Yeah, you know, it's it's not it's not a quantity business model as much of a, as much as a quality business model. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah and, but, you're, and you're more apt to get different people because, like you said, you have all that strong man equipment. Yeah, other gyms don't, so you're going to get that draw of people that want a power lift like that. Now, do you still have cardio equipment? Yes, yeah, we we have a full line of cardio. You know, I have one treadmill, three rowers, two two air bikes, two spin bikes, a stepper, and an elliptical. You know, it, but it's not half the gym. It's right, 15, right, right. Fifteen percent of the gym. I dig that. A lot of the stuff we do for cardio is, is conditioning stuff. You know, CrossFit style wads, pushing sleds, pulling sleds, rope work. Um, Different, different kind of more skill oriented conditioning. Um, there are people that do steady state cardio. We have a lot of bodybuilders that will come in and do facet cardio for an hour, post workout cardio, stuff like that. So it's important to have that, but that's not the staple. You know, okay. we, we, we don't have fifty treadmills and an ab mat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. Well, a lot of yeah. gyms. That, that's what a lot of gyms look like too. Well, that's the business model. Yeah, you know, and and that appeals to probably eighty percent of. The, the pie wheel of gym goers. We, really? We, we appeal to the 20. So most when most people open a gym, that's what they're going for? I mean, assume, but I, I can tell you definitively that if there is a shift happening in the industry, it's shifting away from that corporate spa kind of, yeah. um, you know, a lo lot of machines, a lot of cardio structure, yeah. and it's, it's becoming more. And, and we, and you know, no one, no one wants to admit it, but we have CrossFit to thank for that. Really? Everyone hates on CrossFit, yeah. but I'll tell you what, that's the first type of exercise or the first sport, if you will, that filled 20, 30,000 people in a stadium to watch people lift weights. Yeah. Everyone hates on CrossFit, but they played a huge role in this shift to getting people, more. first of all, off their ass and under a barbell. Wow. No doubt. No doubt. I'm pretty ignorant to CrossFit. I've heard a lot of people talk shit about it. I've never done it, yeah. obviously. But and that's fine. There's, there's a lot of truth to what they're saying. Yeah. 
but the explosion of powerlifting, strongmen becoming more and more yeah. um, popular, and also women in general just being more comfortable and confident and being strong and building muscle is, you know, CrossFit played a huge role in that, a yeah. massive role in that. And also, you know, just, just raising the bar of, of human potential, what was understood as possible. I mean, they if you look at the games... And I, I'm not. A, I'm, I'm the opposite of a CrossFitter. I'm not. A CrossFitter. Yeah, you don't look like a CrossFitter. <laughs> I've, I've won three or four CrossFitters. Well, I would think of anyway. I mean, maybe I'm just stereotyping, yeah. but you, you don't really remind me. No, of a I, CrossFitter. you know, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm just a guy. But I'm, I'm pretty well rounded. You know, I'm, yeah. I've, I'm undefeated in powerlifting competitions. I'm undefeated in just about every strongman comp I've done, aside from the one where I broke my arm at nationals. And I've won three CrossFit comps, so I like to do everything. Yeah. But um, if you, the point I was making is, if you look at, if you look at powerlifting twenty years ago. 2,000 pound total, which is squat, bench, deadlift combined. You guys know what that is? So squat, bench, deadlift combined, yep. 2,000 pound total. 20 years ago, 2,000 pound total was a big deal. Yeah. Today, no. 2,000 pound total is still a big deal. Yeah. Big deal. Yeah. People are getting stronger and stronger, but if you look at 10 years ago, the CrossFit Games and the events that they were doing and what they were accomplishing, what they were capable of, to now, it's like not even human. It's insane. Really? Yeah, it's insane. For those that don't know, what, what does that consist of? As far as CrossFit? Yeah, as far as CrossFit. So, so just like the wads, just the complexity of the wads, um, the amount of weight people are lifting, how much longer they can go, how much further they can go. CrossFit as a practice is basically you do everything. You do everything. It's very wide and very and very wide ranged, whereas strongman, powerlifting, bodybuilding is very is very finite. It's very tunnel vision. Okay. Um, and basically, you know, for the general population, the best way to get better at nothing is to do everything. Sure. Mm-hmm. But these elite level CrossFitters are fucking awesome at everything, and 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 how how much of, as a sport that they have continued to raise the bar each year is, is like nothing else. Really, I'm gonna get chastised for saying this, but it's really? true. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's true. It's true. It's true. You, you can't you can't deny it. You can't deny it. And a lot of the gripe and a lot of the criticism that comes with CrossFit is that your average person who isn't in shape, doesn't know the moves, doesn't know how to snatch, doesn't know how to clean and jerk, probably shouldn't even be squatting at all. They go to these CrossFit classes and they get hurt. Yeah. Now, that's not CrossFit's fault. They could put up the money and work with a trainer for six months and go to a CrossFit class and do very well. And it's so funny because people always criticize, how oh, well, CrossFitters have bad form. Well, you have shit form doing a fucking bicep curl in the gym. At least they're doing a complex move that actually <laughs> takes some skill and there's, you know, places to screw up. So, you know. How, cr- come, how come people hate on it so much? Why did that start, that even came about? Uh, there's there's a lot of pieces, and I'm, I, I don't know, who, who, am I, who am I to say, you know, but um, a lot of, you know, like the vegan stereotype, like what's the first mm. thing a vegan says to tell you they're a vegan? Yeah. Same thing with CrossFitters. CrossFitters, yeah, yeah. Kind of, CrossFitters kind of wear it as like a badge of honor. Yeah. Yeah. But you know something? So do powerlifters. Yeah. So, 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 right. so, so do anyone in any sport. Um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, if, if you are somebody that says you want to do something, you have a goal in mind, and you do what it takes to get there, I got you back 100%. Yeah. A thousand percent. A million percent. Whatever it may be. It's um, it's it's those people that that do what it takes to get to where they say they want to go that that are special to me. I don't care if you're a CrossFit or Paul, if they're a strongman or a bikini bikini figure. I think, I think CrossFit came out and got more people actually training that didn't too. Yeah, exactly. That's the point I made earlier. Yeah. It, it definitely got the most people off the couch. The most people moving. It appeals to a wide range yeah. of people, right? Is that yeah. Yeah, accurate. And and the pieces the pieces that that build that puzzle I think is um, you know it's it's a class structure. So you get in there. There's ten or fifteen other people. You guys are all trying to compete with each other. There's camaraderie. There's community. There's culture. There's atmosphere. Where your typical gym setting, you know, people have their their, their hood up and their headphones on, and right. they're mean mugging everybody. Yeah. So, yeah. and I would say that that kind of. It isn't the case at my place. You know, my place is very community oriented. You know, no one's wearing headphones. Everyone's training. When you go in there on a Monday, there's 15 squat racks. There's 15 barbells in the squat racks with 400 oh. pounds on them. Everyone's training and everyone's doing their thing. Everyone's following their programs. Everyone's doing what they're supposed to do, but they're all doing it together. You have 15 squat racks? Yeah. That's impressive. Most gyms I, I go to or been to are fucking two, two maybe. <laughs> yeah, maybe. And there's two, and there's two guys doing, doing bicep curls. <laughs> yeah, 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 right? <laughs> With terrible form. Yeah, well, it's just it's just, it's just just the structure. It's just the business model. You That's know, cool, we, man. We, we, have, we, have, we have a full rig. We have uh, three in the group X room. We have a power rack with two. We have squat stands, yokes, all that stuff. And, and dude, I'll tell you what, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday nights, they're all full. Those are the they're busiest nights. Yeah, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Thursday is oddly quiet sometimes. Fridays are busy. Saturday, Sunday mornings are busy. 
But um, when it's busy, it's not like annoying. It's not like crowded. It's yeah. like fucking sick. Yeah. It's like the music's on ten. Everybody's training. It's it's really cool. It's really cool. It, you know, I usually have sessions on peak hours, but I really like when I don't. And I get to train when everyone's there. because yeah. the atmosphere is sick. It's so cool. Now, how has COVID affected uh, everything as far as restrictions and training? So bring it back to to what it started becoming a thing like February, March. Yeah. Um, you know, we were supposed to, we were supposed to like limit capacity, say the end of March. And then I think April 1st is when Gina released like the specific, right. no, no more than 10 people in a gathering. Right. So we, um, I think leading up to that, we, we, uh, what do we do? We, we, we said that no members can come in personal training only. Okay. And then, um, April 1st, like right after she dropped that, that update where it was like, only, only, I think it was a uh, one person per 10,000 square feet or something like that, which is 10 people for us. People were, and I know it was 10 and then it was five. That's what it was. April, April was down to five. So we had, you know, five people in the gym plus staff. So it was like eight or nine. And, um, I think what was going on is somebody was calling, somebody was calling the mayor's office because of the part, the, the cars in the parking lot. Someone was kind of ratting on us and then they told yeah. the police and the police had to come write a report. And everybody, I'm sure you guys experienced the same thing. No, no one's like busting balls. Like the cops would show up and they'd be like, hey guys. So. You know, it's supposed to only be five people here. Yeah, we're, yeah, yeah. We're, we're really sorry, but someone called the mayor's office, so we have to come write a report. Mm. And a lot of the cops come to the gym. So yeah. I was like, dude, I totally understand. I'm not trying to be defiant. Just tell me what I can and can't do. Yeah. They're like, it has to be five people. So I said, no problem. So maybe they came back two or three days later, and there was seven people, and they said, we got to shut you down. I said, no problem. I understand. So we shut down, I think, from April to I think June I think June 1st is when it was updated again and we were allowed 10 people again mm-hmm. so we ended up um, it was like that for a month so we ended up send, setting up uh, we used mind body for our financial management and classes and stuff like that so we would have we, we would offer an hour and a half time slots from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. and you know you could you could go online and and, and reserve uh, you know, say 8.30 to 9.30, or 8 to 9.30, and then that would be capped at 10 people. So we did that for a month. That worked very well. And like I said, you know, the people that build our clientele, that our members, everybody wanted the gym to open. So everybody was compliant. Everybody yeah. was really understanding. Everybody cleaned up their shit, wiped everything down. Um, and, and I'm being sincere. Everybody was 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 fantastic. And then uh, fast forward to July 1st, it got, um, it lightened up a bit. I think we were allowed one person per 150 square feet, which is like 75 people, which is mm-hmm. full capacity for us. So okay. we opened up, and we were, we've been fully open since... July and what was really nice is is we opened up so much sooner than mass that all the mass meatheads were coming down to yeah. check out the gym. I mean, a lot of them, dozens, and many of them just signed up for one month. They're like, "Oh, we'll just do a month." It's like 110 bucks for a month. I think we were doing at the time. We just want one month, but then a lot of them loved it, you yeah. know, and um, and a lot of them stayed. So things continued to grow, and then now it's starting to get tightened up again. You know, we, we've, we've had the Department of Health come through like three times and run us through all the checklists and all the forms and things we have to hang up and tape and cleaning and spacing and all that. Yeah. You guys have to wear masks the whole time when you train? We, we, we didn't up until uh, three days ago. Oh, really? So, so when, when Gina tightened, tightened down again. We we just started wearing them three days ago. Really, and it's not that we we weren't wearing we weren't not wearing them to be defiant. It's just when when they came when the Department of Health came, you know, it was kind of like you should you should be wearing masks, you yeah. know. But if you're not, we had signage up that said um, if you're not wearing a mask, maintain a safe distance of fourteen feet. Okay, you know, and um and and we were we were covered as far as we knew. But um, recently, the Department of Health has come twice in the last two weeks to take us through the checklist and everything. And again. They're not, they've been totally kind. I mean, everyone gets different people. There's a bunch yeah. of them. But they come in. They're very, very kind. They have a checklist. They, they want to see our logs. They want to see our cleaning logs. They want to make sure we have the proper signage, the proper things to check, and that we're just basically checking all our checking all our boxes. And then they say, all right, we'll be back in a month, you know. So we're just we're just doing what we are told we have to do mm-hmm. to be able to stay open they as come long as possible. Month? Supposedly. Supposedly once they come... They, they put it in the system, and, and no one will be back for a month. But there was some kind of screw-up. Someone came last week, and someone came two days ago, too. Right. And um, it's just the same thing. There's a, there's a 12-point checklist and then three more, and now masks are on that checklist, so we ask everybody to wear a mask. Now, how did you get into, you know, you've competed in a lot of uh, powerlifting uh, events, and one, you said you were undefeated, right? Yeah, I haven't lost a powerlifting meet. How did you uh, get into that, exactly? When I opened my last place, um... 
the first strong man I ever did was was kind of out of college when I was at Boston Sports Club. I'd never done anything strong man. And to be honest, this girl Drea that I had a huge crush in in high school, nothing ever, nothing ever came of that, unfortunately. But anyway, <laughs> she'll probably laugh. She Maybe now. Yeah, no, she, she'll probably <laughs> laugh. She heard that. But this girl Drea was um, was dating a Seacon cop, and they were doing a fundraiser. It was the Collier County Strongman or something. It was for some officer Collier. I think died in the field, and they had. Um, they just like, hey, I know you lift weights. We're doing um, a strongman competition to raise money for the department. And it's right in Rehoboth. Would you be interested? I was like, hell yeah, I'll do it. So I ended up doing it, and I ended up winning. You know what I mean? It was um, it was it was it was, it was a lot of fun. It was a deadlift, a log, a yoke, and then um, fast forward three or four years, I opened my first location, and this girl Libby, who I think was seventeen at the time, was was working with one of the trainers at my place, and she was like, hey, I want to do this this uh, powerlifting competition. Um, I want to beat the the world record for a 17-year-old girl's deadlift or something. I think it was 205. Mm-hmm. So I was like, dope, I'll do it with him. So we ended up doing the powerlifting meet, and I ended up winning. And I was mm-hmm. like, I guess I'm a powerlifter now. So we started do, we started a powerlifting team and started training powerlifting. Strongman, similar story. This kid, um, Adam, what was his name? But he was training at my gym for a little while, and he was a competitive strongman. And he was like, hey, I'm doing uh, New York Strongest Man. It's coming up in two months. You know, could you, like, sponsor me or can I wear a shirt? And I said, like, dude, I'll do it with you. So I did it with him, and I ended up winning. There and you I'm, go. Like, I, guess, I, guess, I, guess I guess I'm a strong man now, you know. So we started getting the equipment and training. And then, um, you know, that's kind of been my, my, my process is, you know, I don't necessarily train like a powerlifter. I don't necessarily train like a strong man, but I do do the stuff. It's definitely um, – the foundation of the way that I train, but again, like I said, I try and just be really well rounded. I, I want to look the part too. So, um, and you know, I, I ride. You look the mo- part. Yeah, I appreciate it. But I, I you know, I, I, I ride motocross. I like to be able to move. Um, I can do backflips. You know, like I, I, I like to be nimble. Yeah. And if you, if I was to be like the best powerlifter I could be, I'd probably a strongman too. I'd probably want to blow up to like three hundred and ten pounds, mm-hmm. and just become very one dimensional. And that just, you know. It'd be cool to be world class, but that doesn't really interest me. You know, okay, it's, yeah. it's too one dimensional. I'd rather be a little more dynamic. When you can move, I mean, when you're six five, I'm six five. Yeah, I'm like two seventy, two seventy five now. The heaviest I ever got was like two eighty five, but I'm usually between two sixty five and two seventy five. What are we putting up for numbers as far as lifting goes? So I have the, um, I have the, the. I just broke the state record for squat seven forty four. Wow. Um, which which was great, but I'd say probably the best the best squat I ever did was I hit seven hundred for three one time, and it was like lightning. It was a, it was a six set. Um, my deadlift, I was actually I competed a couple weeks ago, and I, I had the intention of beating the the national record, which is eight fifty one, and I, I I fucking had it, but I ended up tweaking my back two weeks out, and I had to I had to take it easy, so I wasn't able to pull. But I, I've hit eight, I've hit eight hundred, I've hit eight oh four. I'm actually the only. I'm the only guy in the state of Rhode Island, in the history of the state of Rhode Island, in any weight class to deadlift 800 pounds. Wow. There's one other guy that did it, but he just he just did deadlift in that meet, and I'm the only guy to do it in a full meet. That's impressive. And I've, I've hit it for, I've hit 806 for a good sharp double, and I've hit 796 for a good sharp triple. So those are my best lifts. I had a pretty bad arm injury. You say you broke your arm? Lightweight. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I had, um, yeah, it's all relative, I guess, but... Um, I had um, my, my first time at Nationals, I crossed the finish line with a sandbag, and my legs gave out, and I came down on top of my oh. arm. It wasn't painful at all, and it wasn't even an adrenaline thing. I just landed on my arm. I was like, fuck, man. And the last event was Stones, which is a great event for me. Um, you know, I was in pain, but not, not so much pain that I didn't think I could do the event. Um, I knew I had six reps, and I was in the back of the pack, so I think I was tied for second. So you get to go last. So I'm watching everybody go, and guys are getting one, two, guys are zero. And I'm like, dude, I got this shit. I'm going to win this event. And I went down to reach to grab the stone, and I just had no strength in my arm at all. So that was in Detroit. I flew home on Sunday, and then Wednesday I went and got an x-ray, and I completely cracked. It's called the Olecranon. It's this bone right here on your, in your forearm, right? It was completely broken. Clean break all the way through, but it didn't, it didn't move. That it was completely broken, but because of my muscle and my tissue, it's held it together. Yeah, so I went in and I got ten screws and two plates put in. This guy John Paxton, who's a great surgeon at the University of Orthopedics. Yeah, I saw the X-ray on Facebook. I think. Yeah, yeah, and um, and you know, I I thought for sure I'd be back in no time, but you I didn't know I, it was broken either. I didn't know it was broken. No, um, it, I, I was very fortunate. It really wasn't painful. When I woke up from surgery, I was in a lot of pain because all those, all that metal in there, but. 
Um, I, I didn't think, I thought I'd be back in six months or so, but um, basically I, I don't have use, I don't have complete use on my left tricep, so it affects my pressing. My overhead pressing is zero. My bench is back up around 400 pounds, which is nice, but it should be, relative to my lower body, it should be mid fives. So I leave a lot of, I leave a lot of pounds on the table. With that, um, I actually am looking to get the hardware taken out. It's been three and a half years, and I think if I get all the screws and plates backed out, it may give me use of my tricep again. So I'm looking to get that done in the next month or so, and we'll see. Do you think lifting like that long term can really damage your body? Like a lot of like guys who've been competing in strongman and powerlifting for you know years, uh, eventually they just break down. Yeah. So um, and th- and that's probably the norm. That's probably what happens most of the time. Yeah. But it, it ha- it's all about mindset and approach. So. You know, we we're, we're um, instant gratification species. Right. You know, we want we want that instant gratification. Definitely. And the truth be told, the strongest guys in the world, the strongest women in the world, are the people that have been doing it the longest, who have been able to just have slow and steady, um, who have been able to be um, what's the word I'm looking for, disciplined, yeah, and just realize that it, it takes time. Now there are these phenoms, you know, like the Larry Wheels of the world and um, the Steffi Cones of the world, who who get really strong really really quick. But what ends up happening is they may they may push it a little too hard. They may be a little too risky. They may burn the candle mm. at both ends, and then their careers are short lived. Yeah. Um, so there's two sides to that coin. It's if you can be disciplined enough and patient enough to know when it's time to take it easy, you can do this. You can do, you know a lot of the strongest guys in the world are in their mid forties. Yeah. But it's a slow, gradual process. Yeah. Perhaps the best um, way to way to uh, communicate that in, in an example is. Um, there's, there's Michael Hearn. I don't know if you guys know who Michael Sounds Hearn Sounds familiar. So he's like early 50s. He looks like he's 20. And yep. he, lo- he looks just as good, if not better now, than he did when he was 20. And then you have Ronnie Coleman. Yeah, of course. Ronnie Coleman is eight-time Mr. Olympia right. best bodybuilder in history. And um, there's this interview, this this video I saw, and I had a brief clip of an interview with both of them. And it's just totally different mindsets. Ronnie Coleman, they asked Ronnie Coleman, like, hey, Ronnie, you have any regrets? And Ronnie's like, yeah. He's like, back, he's like, back when I hit that 800, he's like, I got it for two. He's like... I think I had five, <laughs> right? And this is a guy who's in his early 50s. Right. He's had fucking a dozen back yeah. and hip surgeries. He's crippled. A, yeah. a Generation Iron just did a piece on him, and it's a great, it's a great, great, great documentary, but you, you almost come to tears. I mean, this guy was the best in history, and he's in, he's on crutches. Yeah. He's still jacked. I don't right. know how he's still so friggin' jacked, but he's a cripple. Yeah. Um, he has no regrets. That's just his mindset. He wanted to be the best in the world, and that's it. Now you have Michael Hearn. He's early 50s, just had a baby. Guy looks great. Guy looks healthy. And you talk to him, and he's like, you know, I've been squatting 600 pounds for 30 years. He's like, and back in the day, I hit six, hit 650, and it would fly. And all my boys would tap me on the back, be like, yo, put on seven, put on 750. He's like, and I just, I don't know, it didn't really appeal to me. He's like, I would have rather hit 600 or 650 really, really well, Mm -hmm. other than put on the seven or eight. And he's... 53, yeah. or 50-something, he looks like he's fucking 20, and yeah. he's still squatting 600 pounds. And his body's not completely destroyed. Yeah, so it's kind of just having that gauge, you know, yeah. being, being disciplined and um, and, and just, and just an knowing when it's time to that. back down. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I think that's a smart way to do it. It's just like a fighter, you know, knowing when to, it's time to retire or something, you know? Yeah, and even just even just when you're on, when, when you're competing, you know, taking your rest, taking your off-seasons. Yeah. Um, you know, being smart, get, getting your blood work done, making sure everything's everything's in in, in, in the right in the right spot, so yeah. you can do this forever. You know, yeah. I had a friend who was doing the strongman competitions and big motherfucker, and uh, he was just like he stopped, he retired because he was like I was tired of just waking up and feeling like I couldn't even move. Yeah, and it's also like I said, like you know, if I wanted to be, um, and I'm not. I'm not saying the only reason I'm not world class is I'm not 300 pounds. I, don't, I wouldn't say I have what it takes to really be world class. I mean, maybe who knows, but. The, the the lifestyle and basically, if you want to be healthy, don't compete, right? <laughs> if you want to be healthy, don't compete. Yeah. And and to get to that, to to, to be a huge strongman, the food you have to yeah. eat, yeah, it takes it takes a huge toll. Yeah, on break that down a little bit. The the diet. Well, uh, my, my diet. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Let's say your diet. Yeah. Well, so my my you know. Well, I how does it compare anyway? So let's say if I wanted to push and be three hundred forty pounds, you you guys know who Eddie Hall is? It sounds familiar. Eddie Hall is a great example. So Eddie Hall is somebody who was extremely prolific in the strongman world. He wanted to be world's strongest man. And he has decided, I'm going to do what it takes to be world's strongest man. And he's like 6'1", six, 6'2". Six, and he's going up against, you know, the Half Thors and the, and the, um, yeah. the Brian Shaws of the world who are 6'8", 4'20", 4'40". They're so fucking huge. Right. And, and they're so big. 
they push the limits to be 440 pounds, but they don't push the limits to be 440 pounds as hard as someone who's 6'1 does. Yeah, sure. So, Brian, so on um, Eddie Hall, just one year, just said, fuck it. He, he just, he, he, he blew up to like 430 pounds, six feet tall. He looked like a bowling ball. Yeah. I mean, you, you just look at him like, that guy's going to have a heart attack. He was as red as that towel, <laughs> and, um, but he was huge. Yeah. And, and, and he won. He won World's Strongest Man. And the moment he did, he was like, I'm fucking done. I retire. Really? <laughs> because he was, he was on the verge of death the entire time. Wow. You know, and th- and that's kind of that gauge. That's kind of that um that perspective that pe- that people cripple themselves very very quickly. Yeah. Um, the way that I eat, I I, I work with Stan Efferding, the guy that wrote the Vertical Diet. So I, I follow that. So I'm actually logging my food today, but um, it's a lot of whole eggs, a lot of red meat, a lot of rice, um, and and non cruciferous, low fat, not vegetables, things that that just digest digest very well. Yeah. So um, you know, my breakfast is six whole eggs, spinach, um, some Ezekiel toast, and the rest of my meals. Is is usually red meat, you know, lean ground beef, lean steak, a big pile of rice, and some kind of vegetables. Is that what you eat normally, or just when you're competing? All the time. All the time. You All just time. stick to that. Yeah, and um, it's not challenging because it's friggin' delicious. I'm not doing chicken breast and broccoli. Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing fucking ribeyes and, okay. and bell peppers and rice. It's delicious. Yeah, that sounds and, good. And I do go out to eat sometimes, and I and I will have like a cheat or a, a cheat day. Yeah. But to be completely honest, I, I have to force myself to do it. Really? Because I, ju- I just the food the food that I eat is great. Yeah. It's, it's really really good, and, and I, I think I've become accustomed to it. And I also think I associate how food makes me feel just as much as how it actually tastes. You know, things can yeah. be delicious and they can make you feel great. If, if I eat like shit, I feel like a big soggy bag of wet dick. So I usually yeah. don't. I usually just don't mean, I just rather not eat that way yeah. most of the time. You know, yeah, I always you definitely eat. body changing. I used to it for sure. Yeah. So you said it was a vertical diet? It's called the vertical diet, yeah. So what is, what is that? that? Um, it, it's everywhere. It's yeah. everywhere. Stan Efferding wrote it. He's brilliant. I'm so, so fortunate to have connected with him a couple years ago. He actually flew into my gym twice, did a seminar there. Oh, yeah. I connected him with Arthur Arnold. He's a really special guy. I, I call him all the time. He's always, he's a busy dude, but he's always available. He's a very humble, very, very kind person, and he wrote something called The Vertical Diet. And it, it's not something you have to, you know, people people look at it quickly and like, oh, it's just steak, white, steak and white rice. It's not. It's just it, it, it takes a look at food in, in, a, in a manner that you eat food that your body digests well. Mm-hmm. Digestibility is the most important thing. We're not what we eat, we're what we absorb. Okay. So yeah. getting so getting macros, getting the food in is great and everything, but if, if it doesn't agree with your body individually, um, you know, it causes gastric distress, bloating, water retention, poor mood. Yeah. And if you feel like shit, how are you going to bust ass in the gym? That's true. Mm-hmm. So, and, and a lot of the times, you know, there's a lot of foods that people have been eating, you know, your, your traditional bodybuilding diet, you know, um, sweet potatoes, uh, sweet potatoes, chicken breast, quinoa, uh, what else, broccoli, oatmeal. So yep. all these foods are, are on something called the FODMAP. And I won't get too science because it's boring. Well, maybe it's kind of interesting, but a, yeah, lot of the, yeah. a lot of these foods, like broccoli, cauliflower, quinoa, even sweet potatoes, oatmeal, all these foods are on something called the FODMAP, F-O-D map. It's an acronym that I can't pronounce what it means. But basically, these foods can cause gastric distress. Really? Now, if you or I sit down and have half a cup of oatmeal, we'll probably be fine. But high FODMAP foods have a cumulative effect. So let's say... You know, you used, used, used to be pretty serious in the gym, right? Yeah. So a day of eating would, you would be like, would be egg whites and whey protein in the morning, yep. right? And then you would probably go chicken and broccoli, chicken and broccoli and rice, um, cauliflower, quinoa, sweet potatoes. Yeah, it was similar. I changed it. I, mean, I did the blood type diet. Um, yeah, that's pretty cool. That's some truth to that. Yeah, I did that. However, I'm A positive, and A positive is supposed to be salmon and vegetarian, and I am not that <laughs> at all. So there, there's some truth to it. If you're having trouble digesting foods, you don't know what to eat. You can look at those blood, mm-hmm. those blood, and, and and you know some people have great success with yeah, it. Yeah, well, I mean, it worked for me when I was taking it serious. Yeah, you know, but I, it was like it was chicken and steak, and I was like, when I plateaued, I was like, why the fuck am I not changing nothing? And then I read that, and I was like, it's not really. I didn't have enough stomach acid to break down those proteins, so I had to switch to like fish. Yeah, more fish and turkey and lamb, rabbit stuff like that. What's really interesting about that is the digestibility. Is you can take. Um, I wish I could remember what it was, but it's super inexpensive. It's a digestive enzyme that's already in your stomach, and you can just supplement it, and it'll help you digest all those foods. Oh, yeah. But basically the point I'm making is the typical understanding of dieting is is very low fat, right? So you have uh, lean chicken breast, you have broccoli, you have oatmeal, um, and all a lot of those foods are on the FODMAP, and they have a cumulative effect. So if in the same day you have a couple cups of broccoli, cauliflower, some quinoa, and oatmeal, these are all healthy foods, yeah. right? Well, 
they can fuck up your digestion big time. They really? can cause gastric distress. And all these people are dieting, training their ass off. Like, why am I so watery? Why, are we, yeah. why do I feel like shit? And it's, well, a lot of these healthy foods, which are healthy. They do have micronutrients. They yeah. are real food. They are vegetables. But they're on the FODMAP, and they can cause gastric distress. So I avoid all that shit. Yeah. I avoid all that shit. And um, as far as protein, chicken breast is fine. You know, ground turkey's fine. Um, egg whites are... Gay, but what, I mean, <laughs> but but I, I lean more towards the red meat and and the uh, and the whole eggs because of the micronutrients contained within them. It's just a superior source of protein. You're getting vitamin B. You're getting choline in the eggs, which is so important. Um, you're just getting more bang for your buck with that with those types of, uh, of of sources. So that that's that's what makes up to the majority of my diet. So you don't think um, red meat is bad for you? I know it's not bad for you. Okay, because yeah. I've heard so much different stuff. Yeah, so it, what it is is um, what it is, is is cholesterol. So people get very scared of cholesterol because um, dietary cholesterol, and what I mean by that is, is the cholesterol that you eat. Um, they believe it's associated with blood cholesterol. So basically if you have high blood cholesterol, if you eat red meat and whole eggs, yeah. which contain cholesterol, that it will raise your cholesterol. Right. They're finding that that's not true. And the FDA, I believe, is in the process of officially changing their sta- their stance on that, but they're kind of dragging their feet because they've been saying one thing for yeah, 30 for so years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they can't, you know, it's, it's tough for the FDA to be like, well, I fucked up, yeah. you know? So, yeah, sure. <laughs> but, um, but basically... Cholesterol is, is very hereditary. High cholesterol is hereditary. Yep. A lot of that, that's the biggest factor. If, if, if people have high cholesterol in your family, you're probably going to have high cholesterol. The other things that, that determine that is, um, is stress. Yeah, you know, f- that's uh, a big one. Yeah, psychological stress absolutely can jack up your cholesterol. And processed foods and foods that don't digest well. You know, and, and th- those uh, are what will elevate your blood cholesterol much more than uh, whole eggs and red meat will. And, of course, it's lean cuts of whole meat. It's the leanest cuts. Um, I actually rinse my ground beef after I cook it to get rid of a lot of the fat content, and I'm still getting all, all the good stuff. So is it, um, do, would you say it takes a lot of dedication, though, to, to you know eat the diet that you do? Um, it's a fair question. and I, I know, It's just like a um, lifestyle. I'm, 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 I know I'm different, but no, it, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't take dedication at all. It doesn't take discipline. I just think that... Um, you know, I, I'm just the type of person that if, if I want something, I'll do what it takes to get there. Yeah. And, um, and the thing with food that's so interesting and why I'm so troubled and I have to, I'm, I'm not the best coach because I'm not empathetic and I don't understand people. If, if, you, if you want to, to look a certain way and feel a certain way and if you can be told, hey, eat these foods, it's going to get you there. I don't understand why you wouldn't do it. And additionally, when, when you eat food, that isn't, you know, that, that doesn't digest well or is probably poor. I mean, I don't know about you, but I feel like shit. Yeah. I feel like shit. Yeah, you notice, I definitely notice a difference. Oh, man, my tits feel like this sagging. <laughs> I feel my fucking gut over myself. I feel like I have a double chin. I feel a little swollen and inflamed. My joints hurt. So, you know, the, the short answer to your question is, is, is if I don't eat this way, I can't do what I need to do right. in the yeah. gym, and I, and I feel like garbage. It affects you mentally, too, probably. Oh, no doubt. Uh, yeah. Mental clarity, here's, here's another, this is another tip worth saying, is salt. So salt has been demonized for years, right. which, especially in the bodybuilding and training community because it's associated with water retention. Yeah. That is completely false. Really? Salt, especially iodized salt, mm-hmm. is, um, so- sodium is literally involved in the chemical equation that creates muscle contraction. It's literally part of the process. That calcium and a bunch of other stuff that I'm not smart enough to know. But people who are low salt, who then start salting all their meals, it's life-changing. Mental clarity, um, pumps, how good you feel, your energy. Um, people who are low salt, who implement more salt, it, it can be life-changing. It can really? be absolutely life-changing. And again, that's a common misconception. Yeah, no, yeah. Um, along with cholesterol and, and other certain fad diets that, that, have, that have kind of polluted people's minds. What do you think about the keto? Um, so keto, so keto, fasting, these are all great tools. Um, the, 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 the blanket answer to this is whatever you'll stick to, whatever you'll be compliant with is the right diet for you. Yeah. There's no right or wrong answers for this stuff. Different for everybody, right? No, same thing with training. You yeah, know? sure. I'm a barbell strength guy. Yeah. Um, if you hate barbell strength shit and you like aerobics and step aerobics, that's what you should be doing. Yeah, like, yeah. No doubt. Right. Same thing with food. Whatever you can stick to, whatever's comfortable for you, whatever you like is, is the key. Compliance is king well, a lot over easier. everything. Stick, stick to it. Yeah, absolutely. That, that that's the that's the thing. Now, something like keto uh, for those of you, most people know, but it's very very high fat, moderate protein, little to no carbohydrates. Yeah. Um, the the benefits associated with that is um, uh, 
sustainable appetite, so it's a great way to lose weight because fat is more satisfying. Right. You don't need to eat more food, so your calories are lower. And that's really what causes weight loss is low calories. Mm -hmm. You know, you have keto, you have low carb, you have carnivore. Basically what they do is they eliminate a food group, so overall you're having less calories, so you'll lose weight. Um, and the other thing that's nice about keto, the reason why I say it's a tool is something that I do myself. If I start feeling uh, chubby or lethargic or my, or my body fat's going up, I'll cut carbs out for two or three weeks, or however long is necessary, because when you cut the carbs out, then when you reintroduce them, you're super sensitive to them. They're more likely to be absorbed into muscle rather than stored as fat. Does that make sense? Yeah. So keto is a great tool to um, become more sensitive to carbohydrates. Reset Carb your body. Exactly. Carbohydrates yeah. are... are, 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 are um, are essential for cell growth. So that so you know the keto structure is, is something that I would definitely implement to create sensitivity. Same thing with fasting. Same thing with fasting. So I'll fast um, you know on a Sunday maybe once, twice or three times a month. Um, if my appetite starts to go to shit and then it'll help me be hungry again. Mm -hmm. So these are all great tools. In reference to people who want to do keto, want to do intermittent fasting like for life, if it fits for you and you're, and you're smart about it, and you cover all your bases, I'm, I'm all for it. You know, what you stick to is definitely the best plan. There's an individual bias to all this shit. Where are you at with carbs? Like, um, what's your carb intake? I mean, it's high. It's, okay. it's friggin' high. Certain car complex <laughs> carbs? or uh, you Usually ones that digest quick. So all my carbohydrates come from uh, white potatoes once a day, okay. a ton of white rice, and fruit. And juice. Okay. So me being lean. And good being, carbs are those good carbs. Yeah, those, those are all, those are all. Because I've read different things about. Because I'm always I'm, I'm always reading up on this shit or trying to, and I see I read different things that yeah. too much carbs are bad. And, and that's what's so challenging is this. Then so when much, you train, you need them right for recovery. Of course, yeah. of course. There, there's so much info out there, and so much of it's freaking garbage. Right. You know, um, and there's people who may disagree with what I'm saying, but I can I can tell you that. White rice is, is a perfect food in reference to, to digestibility. Okay. If you were to take a million people and feed them all white rice, one or two of them might not be able to digest it well. The rest of them digest it perfectly. Oh. So white rice is definitely the staple carbohydrate. I like white potatoes because they're low on the FODMAP, and they also have, contain potassium. Okay. And potassium helps with, with a myriad of things. It's a very yeah. important electrolyte, and it also helps absorb carbohydrates. So I try and have potatoes once a day. In reference to um, juice, so if someone was overweight and wanted to lose weight, I would recommend they have an orange or two a day because yeah. um, the orange has a lot of micronutrients, but one of which that stimulates the liver, which helps absorption and digestion. Someone who's trying to gain weight, I use orange juice. So I have oranges in the morning, and throughout the day I'll have like little three-ounce sips because that has the same effect on my liver, and it also elicits appetite, helps me eat more food. Um, and then there's fruits. You know, berries Berries yeah. are great because they, they're high in micronutrients. They have a lot of um, phytonutrients and things like that. So um, basically, if you guys haven't picked it up already, every source that I go to, it's not just carbs, fats, and protein. There's another piece. There's a micronutrient piece. There's another, there's another reason why I choose these mm. sources over others other than just trying to hit my, the my macro. the most benefits out of it. Yeah. And, and overlying all of it, it's, it's that it digests well. You want food that, that your body digests well. And we're all different in that respect. Sure. Um, switching up a little bit, can you run us through your training regimen, like on a regular basis? Yeah, so, I mean, it changes throughout the year. Um, there's like, you know, I, I feel so silly calling myself an athlete and saying that I have like an off-season and a preseason. Well, I'd say you are, yeah. I, I as much a, as you've competed. I, I have a hobby. I have a hobby. I don't necessarily I mean, get paid for it. I mean, deadlifting fucking 800 pounds, that, that, that's pretty fucking athletic, I Yeah, think. Right, well, I, I, I appreciate it. And you I really, back I really do. Back six, five. Yeah. <laughs> and and I, I appreciate that. But, you know, I see these people, you know, they call themselves athletes. Like, you ain't getting paid, motherfucker. You have a hobby. What you're doing is the same thing as playing magic cards. Except, <laughs> you know, give me a fucking break. But anyway, um, you know... Off-season training tends to be higher rep, more volume, more bodybuilding, I guess, but still using the competition compound lift. So I, I work out probably five to six days a week, and right now I'm doing a split routine where I'll have you know a squat day, a bench day, uh, a deadlift day, and then a shoulder press day, and there's all kinds of accessories that, that go throughout it. Um, and, that, and that split, I probably do that four months of the year. And then the other eight months of the year is more of a higher frequency program. It's still five to six days a week, but basically those exercises, rather than doing all squat stuff in one day, you know, so let's say if I, you know, let's say if I open up with a squat, I'll do a squat and then a couple variations of the squat and then I'll fucking murder my legs. On bench day, same thing. I'll do, I usually do bench and row together. So I'll do bench press, I'll do rows and then I'll murder my chest. The, so that's four months of the year. That's off season. In season, it's more sport specific. It's a higher frequency program. So I'll basically squat twice a week, deadlift twice a week, press four times a week. And if I'm doing strongman, I'll work those events in as well. So basically, what the benefit of that 
and you can, there's no right answer to this question. You can argue either way. But the benefit of that is it basically spreads the stimulus out across the week. So you can get basically, let's say, the amount of work I can do to my legs in one workout, if I strategically spread the stimulus over multiple days in a higher frequency program, at the end of the week, if you were to calculate all of the total tons moved and the work done, I'm probably getting more work in the higher frequency program than the split routine program. So it all depends on where I'm competing, what the events are, and what's going on. But like I said, usually five to six days a week, a um, lot of compound lifts, a lot of barbell work, and, uh, and the strongman implement stuff too throughout the year. Do so you take one day off, rest day? Yeah, and, and, and usually it's set up. Usually, like, I'll have, like, a, an idea where, you know, I'll go three days on, one day off, two days on, one day off. But if I'm feeling like shit and I'm tired, I'll, I'll take a day off. You know, it makes sense. you got to give your body time to recover, right? Yeah, and that's something that people really struggle with a lot. Everyone's like, every day, every day, every day. And I'm like, well, you're probably not working fucking hard enough. That's why you don't need rest. You're probably going to train a little harder. That's yeah, why. true. Yeah. You're probably just scratching the surface. <laughs> yeah. If I were to put you on a program, I bet you'd be begging for your rest day. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Fair enough. When, uh, during, when you're training for strongman, so what is it, just you would just implement different exercises? Yes, yeah, so, um, and this is this is something that I communicate to a lot of people that I work with, so a lot of strongmen will do the will do the event stuff year-round. I, I really don't. Uh, my, I, I, the bar- well, you train year-round anyway. Yeah, the, the, the barbell stuff is year-round. The barbell stuff is, is the staple, so the squatting, the pressing, the rowing, the pull-ups, you know, that that's the baseline, and that, 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 that never goes away. And the reason why I argue that over implementing the strongman stuff is because the barbell stuff is very easy to to manage and evaluate and overload and i know that if i improve my squat technique and my pressing technique i'll be better at picking up a stone i'll be better at picking up a log i'll be better at carries where the the inverse isn't the case if I were to prioritize stone and log and yoke walks for six months, if I go back to the squat, it's probably going to be trash. Mm-hmm. I've, I've, I believe there's tremendous carryover to the barbell lifts to everything else rather than vice versa. So to answer your question, if I'm prepping for a strongman competition, you know the events months in advance. So I'll work them in a couple months out, but at the end of a workout, very light, just to get a feel, yeah. kind of do circuits and conditioning with them. Then as I get closer to the meet, maybe as close as two months out or six months out, I'll start working those in a little bit more and, and let them move to the front of the workouts. But I got to I gotta tell you, even even two weeks out of a strongman competition that doesn't have a squat, I'm still squatting first in my workout. Then I'll go, then I'll go to the implement. Because I just find that, that prioritizing that stuff has tremendous carryover to everything else, including strongman stuff. So you squat a lot. You squat quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. Squat, I mean, squat and deadlift is, is about the same. And then pressing I can do a little more often. One, because I'm injured, so it's never really heavy. And two, because it doesn't beat you up as much. It doesn't, it doesn't tax your central nervous system as much as the big lifts. Yeah, that makes sense. But if, if I had, if, if, you, if, if the three of us were like, yeah, we can only do one lift for the rest of our life, what's the best bang for your buck? It'd, it'd be a squat. Really? It'd be a Would squat. you say that's the, I guess, the best? It's 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 the coverall. It's it's compressive. Um, it, it's, it's obviously total body aside from, like, pressing, but... Um, it taxes your endocrine system. Um, it's, it's, it's definitely the, the most important. And I wouldn't be surprised if you were to say just squat for three months and then do a bunch of other lifts as opposed to just benching yeah. for three months and then do a bunch of other lifts. You would notice a tremendous decline in the rest of your performance really? doing other lifts other than the squat. I believe that it, that it kind of it covers a lot more than other lifts. A lot of people say that. Well, I yeah, feel like this society, though, is very focused on benching. Like It's, it's like, yo, yeah. man, how much you bench, bro? <laughs> yeah. Bro, how much you benching that's, right that, now? And that's, if you're always, like, that's always you're the like, question. Yo, I can only do like 225. You feel like a fucking pussy. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like, yeah, that's always <laughs> the question, how much you bench. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and, and like I said, every Monday you go into a gym and, and the bench is are all jacked yes. up. Why is it Monday, too? Why did it become fucking Monday? Because it's the first day of the week. You've been, you've been partying all weekend, and the first thing you want to prioritize is your bench. But you come into my gym on a Monday, everybody's fucking squatting. That's everyone's squatting. Monday squat day. <laughs> yeah. No bullshit. Every, every single rack's got a body in it. It's fucking it's awesome. And people love concentrating on their biceps. I feel like it's bench, biceps. Yep. All, all the mirror muscles. Bench, <laughs> delts, biceps, and abs. Little little toothpick legs, no back. Yes, yeah, yeah. That's not the that's not the look you want to have, right? And, and not only the look, but that that that's a, that that's a that's an appetite for disaster. You know, yeah. when, when you when you train like that, you become very anterior dominant, and all uh-huh. these guys have all this back pain and shoulder pain. And they yeah. have no idea. All I do all I do is train my chest and shoulders. Why do my shoulders hurt? It's because you're you're ferociously imbalanced. The body's yeah. not supposed to be like that. You, you, most of your training should be the muscles you don't see. 
What's a workout routine that you'd recommend to somebody? Um, I mean, I'm sure you have your own, but yeah. like, if someone was to try to, you know, look something up or, well, it's you know, I'd love to offer offer a, a blanket answer, and this is not me by any means making myself sound more um, more important than than I am, but it's it, it, the, the the right answer. The, the the true answer is always it depends. It depends on the person. Yep. So if someone were to come to me and say, "Hey, I want to, I want to start working out," you know, um, I haven't been doing much. What should I do? Nine nine times out of a hundred, I recommend three total body workouts a week. That's the starting point for anybody, and, and, that, and that's somebody who has, let's say, all the free time in the world, expendable yeah. dollars. Let's say if someone comes in, they're like, "Hey, man, I just broke up with my girl. I'm fucking devastated. I feel like shit. I want to work out seven days a week. Give me a diet. Give me a plan. Tell me all the supplements I'm in." Yeah, I'd be like, "All right, slow down." <laughs> number one, number two, we're gonna we're gonna do three total body workouts a week. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, or Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, whatever. We're gonna do three total body workouts a week. We're gonna do that for probably two or three months. I said, I'm not going to give you a diet. I want you to write down a food diary of what you're eating right now for three days. I'm going to see what you're eating now, and I'm going to make some adjustments to it. Because it's it's all about sustainability. It's all about um, compliance, like I said. So yeah. Someone, someone, if someone's you know, someone's really motivated. That's great. But if they, if I write them the perfect diet, if it's dramatically different to what they're doing now, they ain't going to stay on it. Yeah. Right. And even, right. If, even if they do stay on it enough to see great results, they're going to fall off. And they're going to lose yeah. all their results. That's that that a good approach to do it that way. And it's the yeah. same thing with training. It's the same thing with training. You know, if someone's kind of sedentary or, or is in the gym a little bit and they, they really want to start working hard, I'm going to teach them how to move really, really well, so that when they when they do a movement or an exercise, they're getting the most out of it. And three total body workouts a week, like I said, not the split routine, not legs, not upper body, because if you come in and you're green and you do legs for an hour and a half you're going to be hobbling around for two weeks sure. <laughs> right so why not spread that stimulus across the whole body mm-hmm. why not hit squats overhead press and lats on day one take a break maybe come in do some cardio do some active recovery so you feel fresh for wednesday wednesday we'll do a deadlift press and row workout and then friday we'll do a variation split with, with some arms or something like that. And I would run that for as long as necessary. It could be a month. It could be three months. It could be four months. But you can manipulate the variables within that structure for a long time before you go to the four- and five-day-a-week plan. You know, And if you're somebody that has been going to the, you know, a lot of the people that come to my gym are people who have already been in the gym for eight to ten years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, my, my question to them is, all right, great, what are you doing now? You know, and I'll take a look at what they're doing now, and I'll, I'll, I'll ask them, what the last three months have been in reference to the progress they've made and how they feel. If it's like uh, kind of none, then I'll throw a bunch of wrenches in the system and, 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 and change it based on what they're doing. As far as manipulating the nutrition, it's, it's the same the same concept yeah. as the first guy. What are you eating now? All right, great. Here's some small improvements we can make. We'll check back in two weeks, see what's changed, and make adjustments again. You know? Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. yeah. It'd be so great to be like, bro, keto and CrossFit. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. all you need, right? That's what you want. But that's it's, the easy, it's, it's, easy it's way. Just, it's just not, that's just not the, the show. That's the reality gonna, of That's it. not going to work. Yeah, yeah. Not that either one of those things aren't great. They yeah. can be great for the right person, but it, it has to be individualized. Now, do you do a lot of cardio? I, I don't um, because I don't really, not, not that I don't have to, but... I train for you know two two and a half hours when I do. Yeah, and um, I'm I'm lean and I'm I'm also I'm also pretty well conditioned. You know, I can run a mile and probably I could probably run a mile in six minutes. Okay, well, now if I if if I if I were to go out for a jog or a hike and I'm like fucking dying, shit, man, I gotta do some cardio. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But the the type of training I do. Um, how it's dynamic and how it seems to kind of cover all we're bases. Still cardio, still cardio in essence. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, you're still getting some cardio. Yeah, in anyway. my, my heart, my heart's healthy. Yeah. Um, I definitely, I definitely can manage stress over a period of time. Um, and I, I do. I, not, not if I'm 12 weeks out from a competition, I won't. But like now and and during the off season, I'll do like CrossFit style conditioning workouts. Uh, my girlfriend Jen is uh is, is very into that type of metabolic conditioning so what okay. was really cool is i'll do that shit with her and she'll do the strength stuff with me uh, so it's more it's more conditioning stuff it's not like just straight cardio on a bike or a treadmill you have an outdoor facility outdoor area at the gym we, we yeah we, we were fortunate we have our own parking lot so we go outside we got tires and yeah. sled drags and truck pulls and stuff nice cool. but um n- nothing it would be dope to have like say an outdoor wall because it's a it's a loading dock, my mm. place. But if I had like an outdoor wall, I could set up a couple squat racks outside. That'd be really cool. Yeah. But um, we do have an outdoor area, and there's garage doors, which is really nice too. Mm. But um, you know, n- n- nothing really extravagant. So, uh, what are your upcoming plans for yourself in the gym? Well, right now, you know, we're kind of at the mercy of what's going on. You know, uh, everyone's talking about a holiday shutdown, so we'll see. We'll play it by ear. We got a 
an event that's normally huge called the Super Total. We had 50 competitors, probably 200 spectators last year. Oh, shit. So, the, yeah, but the next one's coming up Saturday, and we have, like, 11 competitors, and there probably won't be a lot of spectators. It's going to be small. Yeah. But um, we have that in the books. We have um, a power of the meet, an RPS power of the meet February 7th. Another another USPA power of the meet at the end of at the end of March, and we have a huge uh, national qualifier, an Arnold qualifier, strongman competition, Ocean State strongest man, I believe at the end of June, and that's going to be massive because it's a, it's an Arnold qualifier, mm-hmm. which means this particular competition qualifies so the winner goes to the Arnold, which is you know yeah one of the two biggest strongman competitions yep. in the world, so people will be traveling from all over to compete in that event. That's going to be massive. It's going to be cool. Where's that? Where? It's at my gym. Oh, right. Yeah, oh, it's at the gym? Yeah, yeah. So, Ocean State Strongest Man 5, we, we, we got the bid for the, um, I forget exactly what it's called, Platinum Plus Arnold Qualifier, mm-hmm. and there's only one or two of those a year. Oh, yeah, that's so, people are going to be traveling from all over to compete at that one, no doubt. Yeah, yeah that's fucking good. Yeah, so those are the events. Um, and again, you know, as far as as far as other things, we're kind of at the mercy of what's going on. Right, we're still we're still full full speed ahead. You know, staying with staying compliant with all the rules, and it's been great. But if we have to shut down, we'll shut down. If we have to go limited capacity, we'll limited capacity. We're just kind of playing it by ear, uh, like everybody else for now. Yeah, I think that's all you can do right now. Yeah, and um and and we're doing it with a certain degree of humility and understanding. You know, everybody's really frustrated, everybody gets really aggravated, and then they hate this person, they hate that person, they disagree, this is bullshit, that's bullshit. I don't know, man. I, you know, I own a business, and I want to stay open, and I want to continue to make money, but I also see the big picture. Yeah. And um, and I think we just got to chill and, and understand a bit, and the, the more compliant we are, and the more serious we take whatever we have to take, I say the quicker we're ahead of this thing. I agree with you. No, I, I agree. I think other countries have done that and proved to be successful. Yeah. You know? But it take it takes everybody to have that kind of same mentality. Yeah, and yeah. most people are just angry. Most people are just angry. Well, and, and, and I and I get that. But if, if if you're fucking around and you're not you're not doing your part, it's just gonna drag the situation yeah. out even longer. Well that's why we were just talking about that a couple couple episodes ago. Um, in Australia. They just got out of their quarantine, I guess it was three weeks ago. Yeah. They've been on since March. <laughs> but yeah. they haven't had a case in 14 days, it's telling me. So. Yeah, yeah. But they, that's that's heavy to be fucking... I mean, everyone... Well, maybe that miserable. was the right approach from the beginning. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm also a little biased. I'm very fortunate. Like like I said, I didn't... I, I didn't... I haven't lost my gym. I haven't lost my business. Yeah. Um, there's thousands of people, you know, who, who are out of work, who lost their business, who lost their job, and I'm sitting here like, guys, come on, just do what you're told. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, 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 I, and I have a different, you know, I'm, I'm very, very fortunate. And also, as far as my life, I don't really do a lot, man. You know, yeah. I go to the gym, I eat, Train. I sleep. You know, so as far as, like, my life as a whole being um, affected by this, I'm just annoyed that i got to wear a fucking mask when I go grocery shopping. That's really <laughs> as far as it goes yeah, yeah. for me. And, and so, so I'm a little biased in saying that. I'm, I'm, very, I'm very lucky, and I feel for those who have really been affected by this. Um, however, I just hope that things come together and, and we can put this behind us uh, sooner than later. I agree with you on that, bro, for yeah, sure, man. man. Um, why don't you give out your social media, your website, where you can be contacted? Social the media, uh, I'm, I'm on Facebook, Steve Tripp. Uh, my my Instagram is Strapini at Strapini S T R I P. No, I'm, I'm sorry, Strip Camp S T R I P P C A M. It's not X rated. My name's Steve. Tripp. <laughs> <laughs> my name's Steve Trip, and you know Instagram camera. That that that's that's what I did years ago, and I stuck with it. No matter how many people think I used to be in the industry, I'm not. <laughs> um, and then the the website at the Top Strength Project for Instagram, and the website's uh, topstrengthproject.com. Pretty straightforward. Um, we're there. We're very active on social media. All of our updates, events, things that are going on. Um, myself and my whole staff is on the, the Instagram page of the Top Strength Project. So if you want to message us, you get all of us. If you want to contact me directly, at Stripcam, S-T-R-I-P-P-C-A-M. Very cool, man. We'll definitely promote those for you. We'll you, post still them go, uh, you still do that fucking thing on the Sacco River? <laughs> oh man! Luckily, luckily, those years are behind me. But I did that. I, I did that for nine years strong. Nine oh, years I remember. Strong. The last year we went, it was just a it was just a bust out. The water right. was really low. That we, we we didn't float. The weather sucked. Yeah. And I had well, eight. Last, I went last two years ago. Yeah. And it was fucking. It was the water was low. Yeah, I had eight fantastic trips up to the Saco River, but the last one, the ninth one, was was junk. And I think I came home. And like a month later, I, I set the chug, I set the chug ball on fire and, and, <laughs> walked, really? and walked away. Yeah, it was kind of nostalgic, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. 
But that that was a good time. Saco made up up in Fiddlehead. That was that was that was a that was something I look forward to every year for a long time. Yeah, you guys went heavy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, any shoutouts you want to give? Uh Oh, you put me on the spot. I I, 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 I got to be honest. I really appreciate you guys reaching out to me and having me oh, on. Oh man, so, it was great. This was great. Yeah. yeah, I love doing this stuff, and I, and I really appreciate. Yeah, you did a podcast. I seen you did a podcast before too. Yeah, yeah. We we, we started one of the top strength cast. Um, you still going with that? We, we we did three of them, and you know it's funny. People ask all the time, "When's the next podcast? When's the next podcast?" And I'm like, "Ah, oh, yeah, we should do it." Um, I, I have the videos. I was going to upload them all to um to YouTube, but I haven't yet. Um, but yeah, we'll continue to do it. I have four or five guests lined up that want to come on. It's just a matter of, of pulling the trigger on it. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the top strength cast. Cool. So Hell stay yeah. tuned for that top st- top strength cast. Yeah, it'll be uh, coming. Cool, man. Yeah, we'll, we'll promote that for you for sure. Yeah, and um, yeah, that was good. Absolutely, yeah. man. Yeah, Steve, thank you for thank coming you, man. Down. Thank you for coming on, bro. Uh, thank you. Sharing some stories with us. Uh, the top strength project. Com. You guys are in the area. That's four hundred two Walcott Street in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Come down, check the gym out. Have Steve, uh, Steve show you around. You guys while, while, while we still while we still can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. get in there. Down. You got anywhere? You got anywhere from three to five days to get in before they shut us down. <laughs> Hopefully <laughs> not. <laughs> but yeah, man, thanks for coming on the yeah, show. Thank you. Street no, corner right. soapbox. We're fucking out of here. Peace. Follow us on Instagram at street underscore corner underscore soapbox. Don't oh, forget, guys, check us out. Like us on Facebook at Street Corner Soapbox, and subscribe and follow us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google, Stitcher. And all digital platforms. Don't forget, all of our episodes are going to be on streetcornersoapbox.com. Love you all.